Hello there. How's your week been? I hope it's been a good one and I hope that you've had, uh, well, the best of the weather. I know it's not been perfect in every part of the country, but I hope that you've got some sunshine at least. And yes, I've chosen, uh, <laughs> I've chosen a sitting room to record this story and after last week's uh, little bit of a foray into the downstairs loo, I wasn't actually sitting on the toilet. I realised after when I looked at the film back that it looked as though I was actually sitting on the loo while I was reading to you. I had taken a chair in there, but uh, thank you so much for all your lovely messages and things. I'm feeling, as my father would have said, uh, less worse still don't feel 100%. I just get so knackered doing the smallest of things. You know, I'll do a few bits and bobs and then remember my glasses are upstairs, run upstairs, get to the top and I'm like, oh. So uh, I'm hoping that to the result of the, um, I think it was actually the angiogram was done on Friday. I had my heart monitor um, taken off on Wednesday. I had an antibodies test done on Friday as well to see if I'd had COVID because they're suggesting there might be some really rather weird uh, side effects from that as well that, that show a couple of months later. So I'm just pinning everything on, on. It's something that will just pass. But I should be talking to the cardiologist, I would imagine, middle to end of next week. So hopefully there'll be answers there. But uh, thanks for keeping in touch with me. And um, as promised, I have another story for you this evening. And I've chosen yet again a lovely little tale from Maeve Binch's collection, A Few of the Girls. And uh, I hadn't realised there were so many stories in this book. But uh, yeah, this one is a really lovely a happy story. It's been a bit of a weird week, as I say, for one thing or another. And uh, this one has got a really, a really nice feel to it. It's called The Bargain. When Cara met Jim at a party, the rest of the world seemed to disappear. They stood looking at each other with delight and listening to each other in fascination as if they were old friends. When the evening was over, they knew that they would meet again and everyone else knew as well. So they met the following day for lunch and that turned into a walk beside the canal, and they spent so long over a cup of coffee that the waitress had to ask them to order another one or leave. They were both aged 28. They loved travel and jazz and cooking and dogs. His mother had died three years ago. Her father had died at the same time. Jim knew the fellow who was giving the party because he'd been on the same hurling team as him way back when they were kids. Carla knew him because he was a driving instructor, and he had helped her to get her test. Cara was a short story writer. She had gone to the party to celebrate having finished her latest collection of stories. Jim sold agricultural machinery. He'd come to Dublin to celebrate a big sale, and his father making him a partner in the business. Finally, they hit one problem. Cara lived in Dublin. Jim lived 200 miles away in the country. He was going back home the following morning, so they talked nearly all night about what they would do, and finally, exhausted, they agreed that Cara would make the journey to Jim's part of the world the next weekend. They made a bargain. If Cara hated it, she was to say so. If she thought that she could manage to write her stories there, and that she wouldn't miss her Dublin life too much, then she would say that, and they would get married as soon as possible. That's how sure they were in less than 48 hours. So they both waited nervously for Cara's trip. It involved a train journey, followed by a bus trip. Jim was standing there waiting at the bus stop. Cara's heart leapt when she saw him, looking anxiously at the bus in case she might not be on board. She saw the smile light up his face. He was so generous and warm. Please may this not be a desperate place, she prayed silently. Jim couldn't leave his father or the business that they had both built up, and she knew that. So she would be the one who should move. She lived at home with her mother and a big family of brothers and sisters. She would not be missed like Jim would be. Her younger sister would get Cara's bedroom. Life would go on without her, but Jim could not possibly leave home. His father and his four sisters depended on him to keep the business going. Surely it couldn't be too bad a place. It had produced Jim after all. But the countryside looked very wild and woolly as the bus hurtled along. Frightening looking goats, or sheep maybe, but probably goats. They had terrifying curvy horns. Small rough fields divided by stone walls. It was very far from anywhere, anywhere normal. But she nailed a smile on her face and he held her in his arms for a long time. I was afraid you might not come, he said. They drove together down one of the four streets in the town and out into the countryside. 
The house where Jim lived had old roses in the garden and sweet peas and the grass had been freshly cut. I did that this morning, Jim said. I was too excited to do anything else. They wouldn't let me near work in case I gave the machinery away. His father was stooped over a stick, standing at the door to welcome them. He told me you were a lovely girl, Cara, and he didn't exaggerate. He said with a big, broad smile, just like his son's. Jim's sisters were in the kitchen, trying not to look too eager to examine her. The eldest one was Rose, the bossy one, Jim had said. She was married to a rich man about 20 miles away. A mean man, Jim had said, who didn't like Rose wasting his earnings on things like hairdos and clothes. She was very forthright, he said, sometimes too forthright. Rose looked Cara up and down. We don't often have visitors, she said, but we've prepared a room for you. It'll be separate rooms, I'm afraid. This is my father's house and we have standards. I'm glad to hear it, Cara replied with spirit. It would have been extremely embarrassing if it had been otherwise. Jim and I don't know each other very well yet, and certainly not well enough to share a room. The other girls giggled, and even Rose looked at her with some respect. Cara had won that round. Jim had said that he would build a house nearer to the town. He had the land already, and she would help him choose what kind of house. They would have a big studio where Cara would write, a small office where Jim could do his accounts, and plenty of rooms when the children came along. Together they would plant herbs and vegetables and flowers. And she looked around the table as they sat down for a late lunch, a lunch in her honour, with a full turnout to inspect and welcome her. Would these be her closest friends and contacts from now on, if she was to make this giant leap and live here? Could she bear trying to keep Rose in her place and to encourage the awkward, shyer, younger ones who seemed hesitant of themselves and doubting that they had anything to say unless it was drawn out of them? Would she become involved in the machinery that Jim and his father were buying and selling? Would she find anything to write about in this empty landscape and the small town with the four streets, one church, 17 shops and five public houses? It would be ridiculous to make a decision on the basis of one weekend. And anyway, Jim would have to come and meet her family and get to know them too. They didn't need to rush things, did they? And then she looked across the table at him, his face beaming with pride that she was there. And she knew that there was no point in hanging about. This really was the kind of man she had dreamed of and never met. What did it matter where they lived, really? They would not let Cara help with the washing up. Cara noticed that Rose filled a container with leftover food. Waste not, want not, she said when she was being observed. Oh, you're so right. Very sensible, Cara said hastily. The younger girls took her on a tour to show her everything. The hens, the geese, the old donkeys, the orchard and the cow in the far field. They loved this place where they had grown up. They also loved their big brother. He never brought anyone home before, said one. So we knew you were special, said another. He talked about you all week, said the third. Then Jim came and drove her into town. They walked around and he saluted almost everyone he met. We'll have a drink, he said. Which is your local? Cara asked. In a place like this with a job like mine, they're all my local, Jim said. And he brought her into Ryan's. He'd obviously told everyone in the place about her. Cara realised that they were all expecting to meet her. She shook hands with dozens of people who all said to Jim that he'd done himself well to find someone from up in Dublin. Amazing in the fumes of traffic and all the noise that he'd managed to find such a lovely girl. And then they went to Walsh's pub and the other three. In every place they had heard that she was coming. And Cara began to get a bit edgy, as if she was some kind of travelling exhibition instead of a girl down from Dublin for the weekend. Jim had a lemonade in each place and so did Cara. I've got my pages stuck. She felt full of fizz and bubbles. Only the cafe and the garage to call on, and then they could go home. They all think you're wonderful, Jim said, and so do I. She felt trapped and imprisoned by this marvellous man. She felt this was all happening too quickly. In a moment he would introduce her to the priest and they would set a day, and then she would spend the rest of her life in this small, faraway place. It's too soon, Jim, she said almost in tears. You're lovely. It's all lovely. 
but it's gathering too much speed. It's like something rolling downhill. We had a bargain, he said sadly. If you didn't like it, you were to say so. I just can't say yes or no in 20 minutes, Kara begged. So it's no then. His face was lined with disappointment. They drove back to Jim's home in silence. His father and the girls were waiting inside eagerly. Rose had gone home to her mean husband, taking a plastic box of supper. Cara realised she hadn't known any of these people a week ago, and now she was expected to come and make her life with them. It wasn't fair. She had to have time to get used to it. The supper wasn't as jolly as the lunch had been. Jim said nothing at all, and one by one the others let their chatter die down. I'm sure you must be tired, Cara, Jim's dad had said. You'll be needing an early night. She looked at him gratefully. It has been a long day, wonderful, but a lot of people in it. She said goodbye to them, and there was a chorus in response. Jim looked like a child who'd lost his lollipop. In her bedroom, Cara sat wretched on the side of the bed. It had been a mistake to have rushed across the country after so short a time, giving rise to expectations that couldn't be realised. Just as she was about to climb the stairs, Jim's father had given her a big folder. You might like to read this, my dear, he said. It's my late wife's diary. She wrote it every day. I can't read that. It's too private. It's too personal, Cara began. No, she'd like you to read it, he said. So she began at the start, when Maria had first come to this place. She had marvelled that anyone could live so far from the bustling city where she'd been born and grown up. She could not believe that it was possible to be so far from the theatre and the art galleries, and how could anyone look out at those stony fields and go along the narrow roads without losing part of their soul? But as the pages went on, Maria began to love the place, to know the seasons, to go hunting for mushrooms, to finding sheep that had rolled over on their backs and couldn't get up again. Maria wrote on how she started a mobile library. She had learned to drive and she took books and art books to people who lived far away in farms and villages. She got to know everyone who lived within miles around. She wondered what she'd been doing in a city of strangers, walking past people whose faces and life history she did not know. And all through the story was a thread, even up to the very last weeks, was her love for Mikey, Jim's father. How she'd been nervous of his certainty in their very start. How he was so sure that she was the one for him, and she feared it was a decision too quickly made. She wrote on and on about Jim's birth, and how proud she was of him, and her hope that he might be like his father before him, and find the right one before she died. Cara didn't know what time it was. She looked out of the window. The moon seemed high in the dark sky. The orchard looked beautiful with the old trees casting curled shadows. The old donkey was asleep, standing up with his head on the gate. Cara had read how Maria had rescued him from people who'd been ill-treating him when he was just a foal, or whatever it was you call a young donkey. He'd never done any work, just given the children rides on his back for years. Down in the farmyard, the hens and the geese were clucking contentedly behind the mesh doors that kept the beautiful red fox away from them. Cara could not understand now why she had feared this place. It was very like home already. She blessed her future father-in-law for giving her the diary. She wished she had met Jim earlier, and she would have known her soon-to-be mother-in-law. Yes, of course she would marry Jim. She remembered counting the hours after she had said goodbye to him in Dublin last Sunday night, until she'd seen him again. And now she was counting the hours until morning, when she could tell him that they could see the priest while they were there. She was going to live here. She might as well get married here. After all, that's what Maria had done all those years ago, and she had never known a day's regret. It was lovely, wasn't it? A great story. Well, thank you for listening. Do share it to anybody you think might uh, fancy a chance to just shut off the world and escape for a wee while. And uh, I'll look forward very much to your company this time next week. Away from work until the following week, but you can keep in touch with me as always. Take care, stay safe and stay well.